Thank you. 
decided to pray and sing to God. They made a choice to turn to God and give thanks, and they made the best of a bad situation. So there may be times in your life when things are, dip are difficult, and you may find yourself in an unfair or frightening situation, but at, at that time, you can make the decision to, to do something different. And you can choose to pray and sing to God instead. You can make you can make the decision to make the best out of a bad situation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So always always know that God's with us. So the story tells us that other prisoners listened to Paul and Silas praying and singing, and not only were they strong, they helped the other prisoners understand. <clears throat> that they can also pray and stay strong. Making good choices helps us through tough times. So find your strength and know that God is always with you. So what do we do when things are always not going the best? That's right, know that God is always with us, okay? Cash, can you hear that? Yes. So would y'all wanna say a prayer with me? Okay, repeat after me. <coughs> Dear God, Thank you for being with me in good times and bad times. Give me the strength to always turn to you and give thanks, even when things are not going well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
John chapter 17, verses 20 through 26, as Jesus shares his prayer for his disciples. He first shares this prayer with those gathered in the upper room during his farewell discourse. Yet this prayer is for all of us gathered today as well. Hear these words. I ask not on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be may all be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the word the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I give I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you are in me, they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you, sh whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now will you join me in the congregational prayer? Holy Father, be present in our time of worship as you have been present in every moment of our lives. For your light draws the righteousness, and your joy blesses the upright in heart. Stir in our hearts with us that we may build the kinship we have with you and with one another. Bless us in our community that we may pray in your holy name. Our second scripture reading today comes from the book of Acts, where we've been spending time over the last few weeks since Pentecost. We have celebrated the way that the Spirit continues to move in the early church and calls the disciples to continue the work that Jesus showed them, that Jesus displayed for them. And so now we have Paul and Silas in prison. We hear this story of all the ways that they are challenged and all the ways God moves with them. As we begin our story there in Philippi, one day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, these men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days, but Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had, been given, after they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. 
But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in the house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. May the Lord add his blessing to the hearing and reading of this word. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for mighty acts of faith where we are drawn to share your love and your word with others so they, they might come to know you, O oh Lord. We thank you for the ways that those in the book of Acts demonstrate what it looks like to be disciples, and we ask that you would open our hearts to see how we might be free in the name of Christ. Amen. Nelson Mandela, who eventually became the president of South Africa, was imprisoned for 27 years in various prisons in South Africa during the height of apartheid, the racial segregation that was carried out in South Africa until the early 1990s. While he was in prison, he didn't give up his fight for justice. He wrote letters to colleagues and family members trying to seek justice for those that looked like him. But he also wanted to make a difference in the prison. He sought to learn the native language of the prison guards or the wardens who kept him. Their native language was Afrikaans. And as they learned the language, as he learned the language, he began to get to know these prison guards, not just as prison guards, but as fathers and husbands, as people who liked to fish, as people had, who had lives outside of the prison. Of course, when he arrived in prison and got to know these guards, they were not sympathizers to his anti-apartheid message. But over many years as they spent time in conversation, they began to form deep relationships, and one man, Christo Brand, began to consider Mandela a leader and a friend in his life. While Mandela was fighting for freedom, he was also seeking to help the prison guards free themselves from the work that they did and the jobs that they were encouraged to do to follow the rules of the status quo. When Mandela was released from prison, Brand and others supported Mandela's efforts to end apartheid because of the friendship that had formed. While Mandela was in prison for 27 years, he wasn't shackled by hatred or the evils of discrimination. Instead, he was free to fight for those who looked like him, seeking to end the discrimination that plagued non-white South African people. While the prison guards were technically free, they weren't behind bars after all, they were imprisoned by the injustice that they were called to carry out. In today's story in the book of Acts, the same is true. It appears that those who are shackled in the Roman prison might actually be freer than those who hold the keys to the prison cells. The story of Paul and Silas in prison invites us to ask the questions, questions like, who is really free? And to wonder, what does freedom in Christ look like? Who thinks they're free but are really shackled by the powers of this world? Let's explore the two parts of this story and see how freedom unfolds for the woman who's possessed with the Spirit and for Paul and Silas and the jailer. As I mentioned, Paul and Silas are on a missionary journey. They're spreading the gospel outside of Jerusalem, and one of their first stops is Philippi. Next week, we'll hear about their first encounter in Philippi with a woman named Lydia. But today we hear about what happens after they meet Lydia. As we know, Paul and Silas are both Jewish, and anti-Semitism ran rampant in the town of Philippi. Because Philippi was a town for retired Roman soldiers, a place where Rome ruled. 
So from the very beginning, Paul and Silas were not welcome in Philippi. When the slave girl who can predict the future follows them around, proclaiming that they worship the God of Israel, she draws even more attention to them as outsiders. This woman, a slave, was valuable to her owners because of her gift of fortune telling. Through a demonstration of God's power, Paul heals the woman and frees her from the spirit. And her employers become furious. They're outraged by the sudden loss of revenue, and so they have Paul and Silas arrested. All the judge had to hear was that they were Jewish, and this prompts him to exercise immediate justice. He orders them to be stripped and beaten and thrown into prison. This is the first act of drama. The second act begins with Paul and Silas as they're confined to a prison cell, where they sing hymns of joy and praise to God. It was a strange thing. It would have been a strange thing to hear prisoners singing and praying from the innermost jail cell after all of the suffering they had endured. But their songs and prayer opened hearts. And suddenly, as they were singing, as the other prisoners heard them, an earthquake shook the doors open. Paul and Silas had an opportunity to escape. They were free to go. And when the guard awakened by the violent earthquake as well and saw what had happened, he imagined, he panicked, imagining, assuming that the prisoners had all been freed. He knew of the long and lingering torture that would be punishment for letting these prisoners escape. He knew of the wrath that would come from facing the authorities as he explained how these prisoners got away. So he drew his sword ready to kill himself, feeling that death would have been better for him than facing his superiors. When Paul saw this, with his heart full of love, he cried out, Don't harm yourself. We're all here. The guard looked up and saw the prisoners had not fleed. Those set free, they did not escape. Imagine that. This person's life was more important to Paul and Silas than even their freedom. Or maybe even better yet, the freedom they had through Christ, they wanted to offer to the jailer. You see, the jailer sees his worth and rests his hopes on the authorities of Philippi who employ him. The problem is that these authorities only see him as a man who performs a job and must execute it perfectly. <clears throat> if he cannot carry out this task, if the prisoners escape, he's of no value to them. The irony is that the one who seems to have the keys to freedom, the jailer, is actually the one shackled by his duty to perform his job. And yet Paul and Silas have another message to offer. They offer a new way of salvation to him, one that invites him to rest his hope in the God of Jesus Christ, who claims the jailer as a beloved child of God, offering <coughs> unconditional love. <coughs> we see the same transformation for the slave girl who was possessed. Her fortune telling is not what made her worthy of love and care, contrary to her employer's belief. Instead, she is a child of God, not meant to be exploited. After experiencing this act of love, the guard immediately fell to his knees and cried out, What must I do to be saved? The jailer wanted to experience the inner peace and heart of love that Paul and Silas had. And the answer was simple. The exact quote is, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But in other words, he's saying that trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Give him your life. He will set you free and fill your heart with love. We learn later that the guard became a pillar in the church, a church that soon began to grow and flourish in Philippi, changing the world around it. <clears throat> At one moment, the guard was ready to take his own life, and the next moment, he began to experience the love of God through the likes of Paul and Silas. And he then was boldly proclaiming the good news of Jesus, too. It's amazing what love and true freedom can do. Though Paul and Silas were free to go, free to leave and walk away, leaving the jailer to his demise, they chose to be free to stay instead. 
to proclaim a message of hope to the jailer and others that were in prison that day. I imagine that we have all felt like the jailer at times. We thought we were free, but so many things hold us back. So many things keep us in bondage. We might relate to the jailer's desperation and wonder, how do I get out of this mess? How can I be redeemed? What must I do to be saved? This is a personal question, of course, one that has a unique answer for each of us as we search for grace and love in our lives. We may wonder, what must I do to be saved from what destroys me? What must I do to be saved from my bondage, my oppression, my addiction, my emptiness, my selfishness, my shame, the broken relationships in my life? There are countless ways to lose our way in the world. And we may be under the illusion that we're free until we realize how often the world tries to tell us who we are. That our identity is only wrapped up in our work or our responsibilities or our beauty or our weight. The world tries to tell us what makes us valuable and sometimes we listen. We've been taught that proof of a good life is to never disrupt the status quo. To look a certain way or to succeed in the way society values. But what this story tells us is that Christ has already done the hard work for us. Christ has loved us and offered us grace for free. And all we have to do to be saved is believe. Christ has freed us. We've already been redeemed. There is a way out of this mess that is a life of bondage, but I wonder if we have forgotten if we have been bending to the powers of this world rather than to God's love and freedom. The Holy Spirit has moved among us, freed us from all that the world expects of us, helping us to be our true selves, which is children of God. I have a good friend who often tells me as I head out on vacation or a work trip, she says, or texts, remember who you are and whose you are. Maybe you've heard someone say that to you before. Remember who you are and whose you are. I'm not exactly sure what sort of trouble she thinks I'm going to get in when I go on a trip. But she always says that to me. And I think it's a beautiful reminder of the way I belong to God and to others who love and support me no matter where I am. And I think that's why Paul and Silas stuck around. To remind the jailer who and whose he is. His job is not the defining character of his worthiness. It's not who he is. Instead, he is free. He is saved and he is loved. He is a child of God. That's who and whose he is. That's who and who we are. Though the world wants to define us by our work or our wealth or our accomplishments, that's not who we are, nor is it who we are called to be or how we're called to define one another. Paul and Silas stayed in the jail cell to do the work of disciples. They offered grace and peace, comfort and hope in the midst of despair and darkness. Not in their own lives, but in the lives, life of a stranger. They weren't worried about their own safety because they already knew who and whose they were. And they wanted to offer that same invitation of grace to the jailer. For this is what we are called to do. So one, remember that we too are children of God, that we are free, but also to stay and be with people, to stay and remind people that they are free, they are worthy of love, and they can have hope and trust in a God that is good. Amen. Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last day. Because you give the ministry to the Lord and you have seen, we will be able to send the youth out into the world to serve as Christ's hands and feet. Next Sunday, our youth leave for a service trip to Nashville, and they could not do their work without your prayers and financial support. Thank you for your generosity. May God use the gifts you've given and the gifts our youth possess to God's glory. Offering will be collected after our time of prayer. Whether you're in person or joining us online, you can also give electronically by going to our Facebook page and clicking the Shop Now button. You can also give for check or cash or using the credit card machine following the service. As we turn to the time of prayer, we lift up prayers for ourselves, our community, and our world. At the end of each petition, I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, and you're invited to respond and hear our prayer. Then we'll conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Let us join together in the attitude. Almighty God, just as you freed Paul and Silas from prison, we ask that you free us from our bonds, both seen and unseen. Throw open the doors of our prisons and unfasten our chains. Be with us and in us, O oh Lord, so that we may live in unity as Jesus has called us to do. Through our love, let others know that you have sent us and are in us. We ask this, not just for those here in the church, but for all your people. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we also remember our fathers on this Sunday. We pray for the fathers who have given us life and love, that we may show them respect and love. We pray for the fathers who have lost a child, that their faith may give them hope. We pray for those who, though without children of their own, have nurtured and cared for us. And we pray for all the fathers who are struggling, whether that be in responding to their children, providing for them, or whatever their challenge may be. God, our Father, we ask that you bless these men, that they may be strengthened as Christian fathers. Let the example of their faith and love shine forth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, the Father's Day is a day for honoring and celebrating fathers. We know that this is not a joy day for everyone. There are many of your children who are struggling with needs we may not even comprehend. Remember the fathers who have lost a child, but Lord, we also pray for those who have lost fathers. We hope that you will be a comforting Heavenly Father for them. Lord, we know that there are others facing challenges right now. We ask that you be with them, comfort them, and guide them. Give us the courage to care for them and support them as you have loved us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, break open the prisons of our fears that you free our hearts to acts of loving generosity. Let us be like Paul and Silas, unafraid to give ourselves to you and worship you in all aspects of our lives. Bless the gifts we offer you this day, that all may behold your glory and the love of your people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now, let us join together in the prayer our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Let us now prepare our hearts for the giving of our tithes and offerings.
Okay, stand in front of our help song. We'll be singing the good father. The words will be on the screen. to go forth, we remember 
that in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus tells us to go and make disciples. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus tells us to go and tell the good news to everyone, everywhere. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus promises to send the Holy Spirit to be with us. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. As we are commissioned out into the mission field to serve those in Nashville, we are granted the authority of God to go and act and serve on behalf of God. So I invite you to join me in a prayer as we commission these and others forward. Guiding and loving God, empower these people to be your hands and feet. Help them to glorify you by serving others. Send them into the world to feed the hungry and care for the oppressed. By their actions and words, make them witnesses of your great love and your passion for rescuing your people. Protect them, teach them, and support them as they seek to follow your calling. Fill them with the Holy Spirit and enable them to do their tasks faithfully and joyfully. Bring them safely home and then let their experience further enrich us as a community of faith so that we too will glorify you by serving our community in the love of Christ. Amen. Y'all may be seated. As they um, are seated, I want to remind you, if you haven't seen yet, that we are taking donations for school supplies and old and new shoes. If you want to send those with us on our trip, we need them by Wednesday, and we'll be headed out, like I said, on Sunday. I'm excited to go as well. I um, want to remind you that Wednesday night meals have begun and Wednesday night classes. We have an adult class meeting as well as classes for children, tweens, and youth, so we hope you'll come. Lydia has been leading our youth on Wednesday nights. And our um, children and tweens have been doing a VBS curriculum called um, Come to the Table. And so we're continuing our celebration of our calling as people of faith to gather around the table together. As you go from this place, friends, why we all remember we are commissioned to do the work of God, not just those who are going on mission trips. And might this song echo in your hearts. God loves us, and we are loved by God, it's who we are. We are people who are God's children. As you go from this place, remember who and whose you are, so that you might bask in the freedom of Christ and share that with others. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs> Thank you.